Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News is the state on firm fiscal footing. Acting State Treasurer Liz Moyo goes before the Senate Budget Committee to defend Governor Murphy's budget, taxes and all. New Jersey's new health commissioner is sending out a survey. He wants input from the state's mental health and addiction services providers. Plus, the Facebook founder tells senators he's sorry. Is it enough to regain users' trust? And Newark's first high rise in half a century, courtesy of a favorite son, Shaq's back. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. With a $37.4 billion budget on the table, Governor Murphy's looking to raise revenue by about $1.5 billion. Today, lawmakers heard the acting state treasurer talk turkey and taxes. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. This FY19 budget sets a new trajectory for New Jersey. Acting State Treasurer Elizabeth Mar Moyo this afternoon defended Governor Murphy's proposed budget. She said the state has a structural deficit, that natural revenue growth is not enough to fix it, and so some new taxes are necessary. This is not only unsustainable, it is unacceptable. And the governor is proposing a series of new revenue and budget initiatives to get our fiscal house in order. One new measure is that the state will now hold on to energy gross receipts money. It has long been an off-budget item and given entirely to municipalities. Now the Murphy budget directs that money into the general fund while promising to deliver it all in municipal aid. It's about $800 million. I really believe you're going to have a big lift concerning the energy tax. Uh, I know in my own district, mayors are encouraging to increase that dedication. And even though the promise is being made that the money will be the same, as I always say, I think the reason that people have accepted the gas tax is because it was dedicated for that particular purpose. And to be taking something that's dedicated away, uh, I think is problematic. The governor wants to hike the income tax on the very wealthy and restore the sales tax to 7%. All the while, he is promising to increase school aid, higher education aid, and funding for New Jersey Transit. Promises are, are easy to make, payments are difficult. Uh, right this year, we hear a lot about one-time uh, or, or down payments into the budget. Can you tell me, has there been any extrapolation as to, as to um, what next year's budget is going to look like because of the down payments this year or the, say, two or three years out? We're going to have to work every year and look at every year how, we, how we're trending out. I mean, we have estimates looking at what, you know, the, the K-12 to funding is the first of a four-year formula. As I said in, this, in my opening, this is many of these initiatives are setting us on a path to completion. In the morning, the Office of Legislative Services warned the Senate Budget Committee not to keep dedicating certain taxes to certain programs. Dedication of revenue absolutely has its place, and these are policy, important policy choices that, that you can make. And in fact, the, the dedications that I referred to have been approved not just by the legislature, but by the voters. Those are constitutional dedications. But yes, when we divide money into silos, then we have a certain, uh, we, we've accepted certain limits on our flexibility. Committee Chairman Paul Sarlo says it's too early to seriously consider the tax hikes. We may see unprecedented uh, tax collections on this April 15th um, due date. Um, so before we can consider, and I've been saying that, before we discuss new revenue raisers or new taxes, I think we need to get a handle on how much revenue is coming in from uh, this last round of tax collections in the current fiscal year. The Treasurer and OLS repeat this exercise tomorrow before the Assembly Budget Committee. At the State House, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News.
The social network under scrutiny. Representative Frank Pallone says stronger protections are needed to protect Facebook users' privacy. Representative Leonard Lance wants to know whether Facebook violated an earlier privacy deal. They can ask Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg that tomorrow. Today, it was the Senate's turn to call him on the carpet. Senior correspondent David Cruz has been following the proceedings. David? Marialis Zuckerberg and Facebook have been under fire for a series of data breaches involving Russian hackers and app developers who spread fake news, fake ads, and fake profiles to use member data in an effort to influence last year's U.S. elections. It also reported that as many as 80 million accounts were accessed by a data mining company called Cambridge Analytica, which had been hired by the president's campaign. Facebook says so-called malicious actors have access data of just about every Facebook account. That's 2.2 billion people. Today, Zuckerberg faced a joint hearing of the Senate Commerce and Judiciary Committees and got an earful. Here's a sample of some of that Q&A. It's not the first time that Facebook has mishandled its users' information. The FTC found that Facebook's privacy policies had deceived users in the past. And in the present case, we recognize that Cambridge Analytica and an app developer lied to consumers and lied to you, lied to Facebook. But did Facebook watch over the operations? We want to know that. And why didn't Facebook notify 87 million users that their personally identifiable information had been taken? We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. So now we have to go through our, all of our relationship with people and make sure that we're taking a broad enough view of our responsibility. A Wired magazine recently noted that you have a 14-year history of apologizing for ill-advised decisions regarding user privacy, not unlike the one that you made uh, just now in your opening statement. After more than a uh, decade of promises to do better, how is today's apology different? And why should we trust Facebook to make the necessary changes to ensure user privacy and give people a clearer picture of your privacy policies. What I think we've learned now across a number of issues, not just data privacy, but also fake news and foreign interference in elections, is that we need to take a more proactive role and a broader view of our responsibility. It's not enough to just build tools. We need to make sure that they're used for good. And that means that we need to now take a more active view in policing the ecosystem um, and in watching and kind of looking out and, and making sure that all of the members in our community are using these tools in a way that's going to be good and healthy. I assume um, Facebook's been served with subpoenas from the special counsel Mueller's office. Is that correct? Yes. Have you or anyone at Facebook been interviewed by the special counsel's office? Yes. Have you been interviewed? I have not. Zuckerberg is scheduled to testify before House committees tomorrow. Facebook's influence stretches around the world. It's been used to organize everything from shopping meetups to anti-government demonstrations. But the company's success hinges on the confidence of its users that their privacy is being protected. Once that's gone, even a billion-dollar empire like Facebook can dissolve very quickly. Mary Alice. Thank you, David. A great divide tops today's business news. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, South Jersey is getting shortchanged when it comes to state funding. That's according to a new report by the Rutgers University Camden Walter Rand Institute for Public Affairs. The survey found the poorest South Jersey communities receive a third less in total state funding compared to poor municipalities elsewhere in the state, and the report also found that regional gap is growing. The study looked at state funding from the years 2008 through 2016. A new federal initiative designed to increase investments in some distressed communities throughout New Jersey is moving forward. 
The federal government has decided that 169 municipalities recommended by Governor Murphy will be able to participate in what's called the Opportunity Zone Program. That program aims to boost the local economies of poorer areas by providing tax breaks to investors who fund businesses there. With the tax filing deadline fast approaching, one New Jersey congressman is warning senior citizens to be vigilant of phone scams involving people posing as IRS agents. Representative Josh Gottheimer says scam artists take an estimated $2.6 million each year from state residents. His office has set up a hotline number for residents who have been victims of scams, and he's urging the federal government to crack down on such fraud. This is Equal Pay Day, which is designed to raise awareness of the gender pay gap. According to the National Women's Law Center, women in New Jersey earn 81 cents for every dollar earned by a man. Women of color earn less than that. There is an effort to change this, though, as New Jersey lawmakers have approved legislation to strengthen pay equity. Governor Murphy tweeted today that two weeks from now, he will sign that legislation, which would ban employers from paying women less than men for substantially similar work. It would allow victims of discrimination to sue for up to six years of back pay. That is up from the current cap of two years. The governor called it the most sweeping equal pay legislation in America. And Jay Transit is sprucing up its Elizabeth station. The agency's board has approved spending $49 million to hire a Maplewood firm to design and build a new station that will include longer platforms for boarding, improvements to communication systems, and new inbound and outbound station buildings. On Wall Street today, stocks rally. The Dow is up 428 points. And those are our top business stories. Stockton selling its golf club. The university purchased the Seaview Hotel and Bay course in 2010 for $20 million, then sunk another $22 million into restoring it. Replacing all 1,000 windows and refurbishing exterior walls cost a cool $3 million just last year. Well, now the university's hospitality program is moving to its new Atlantic City campus. So the trustees approved the sale of the century-old club to an as-yet undisclosed buyer for an as-yet undisclosed price. After state controllers review, the buyer will have 45 days to finalize the deal. This year's ShopRite LPGA Classic Golf Tournament will tee off at Seaview June 4th as scheduled. The state's new health commissioner addressed the New Jersey Association of Mental Health and Addiction Agencies at a critical time for them. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. What we are experiencing right now is an incredible sea change that's going on within the area of behavioral health and integrated care. Board President Anthony DeFabio listed several challenges from insufficient funding to regulatory upheaval confronting his statewide association of mental health and addiction agencies. With their services merged last year into New Jersey's Department of Health, providers at the annual conference listened eagerly to Jersey's new health commissioner promote his vision, which prominently features a so-called single licensing plan approach to health care. Which is to provide under the same roof primary care, uh, addiction treatment, and mental health care in an integrated way where pass off of care is seamless and where you have a comprehensive approach to your patients. And when these patients come in, it is best to do as much as possible for them while you have them. Sharif El Nahal expects to have licensing regulations ready by next February. He's also focused on public health crises like the opioid epidemic and high infant mortality rates, where he believes care should be more data driven, real time information on opioid overdoses, for example. And he says your digitized health records should be available to all providers. This is really about quality of care and it's about people's lives. And so uh, to have 
uh, information seamlessly transferred from place to place really helps. And of course, in the mission of mental health treatment and addiction, you see this becoming important as well. El Nahal says 11 hospitals already share patient records, but some providers still feel queasy about providing full access to data. I mean, it's your personal information, your health record, so it's important that they come up with a plan that not only works, but also protects everyone's privacy. The commissioner says he'll be sending surveys to providers. He wants to hear from them about what works best in their practices, and he wants Jersey to actively enroll more people who are eligible for Medicaid services under the ACA. One thing he'll hear providers complain about, outpatient care continues to be underfunded under the new fee-for-service payment system the state adopted last July. The rates that have been set aside by the state, um, they just don't cover the psychiatric services for med monitoring, for psychiatric evaluation, and for ongoing treatment. Um, you know, basically, right now, every time that we see um, someone for a psychiatric hour, we probably lose in the neighborhood of $225 per hour. We need to make sure that the rates are adequate so that they can stay operating. Because the worst thing that we would want is for more clinics to close because they're not able to keep their doors open. So that's why this is a constant dialogue with our stakeholders. The Department of Health survey is expected to go out to all providers in a few weeks. The commissioner is likely to get an earful in response. In Edison, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. A mayor's race is turning on indoor plumbing. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Ocean City, where mayoral challenger John Flood is accusing incumbent mayor Jay Gillian of using more than $690,000 in public funds to rebuild the bathrooms on the boardwalk next to his Wonderland amusement park. In a crossfire of emails and press releases, Mr. Gilliam says the remodeling work is part of a bigger capital improvement plan. Mr. Flood calls the bathroom deal a self-serving backroom deal. Gillian's rejoinder, quote, I've heard of gutter politics, but never toilet politics. The newer, bigger bathrooms are set to open at the end of April, just ahead of Election Day, May 8th. Next to Keyport, where the clock struck once too often. The bells of the town's Big Ben wannabe had been ringing out the Westminster Chimes every evening at 6 o'clock, amplified through the borough's emergency alert system speakers. The tradition, since 2005, served the dual purpose of testing the system and telling the kids it's dinner time. Alas, the Monmouth County Department of Health's environmental coordinator said the chimes violated the State Noise Control Act of 1971 and had to be stifled. They were. Now the bell ringers are lobbying to change the law. Finally, Jersey City and Throwback Monday to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Helen's Pizza on Newark Ave rolled back the clock to 1968, selling a piece of the pie for 25 cents a slice. The pizzeria was opened by owner Steve Kalkanidis' father, Nicholas, who immigrated from Greece. Nicholas passed it to Steve in 1984, and Steve plans to pass it on to his son. Meantime, the lunchtime party drew a crowd of people armed with quarters who purchased 1,000 slices by 4 o'clock. And that's the Garden State Express for Tuesday, April 10th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Newark's first residential high rise in decades was topped off today. And from that lofty height, you can see the Freedom Tower, the riverfront, and the future. Michael Hill reports. In 1992, me and my mother was uh, visiting some relatives. And my mother says to me, I remember when this city used to be beautiful. Somebody needs to come, come by and invest in the city and make it beautiful again. And she gave me that big elbow to the chest like, I'm that somebody. 
Newark native and NBA Hall of Famer Shaquille O'Neal is making good on that nudge. He came back home to celebrate the topping off, that is the completing of the top floor, of his 20-some story 168 market-rate apartment and retail building on Rector Street. The governor thanked O'Neal for never forgetting where he came from and for helping Newark reach its potential. This city is on the rise. Uh, let there be no doubt about it. The mayor says it takes partners. Without state support and state help, most of these projects that we see in the city of Newark don't go up. Uh, it is a great uh, day when we begin to collaborate to actually have buildings happening and not just groundbreakings. The mayor and Goldman Sachs, which helped to finance this tower and a city movie theater a few years ago, said Newark is attractive to deep pocket investors. What it taught us is that you want to work with partners who are not just not just going to do the glassy towers downtown, but also are willing to do the projects that are in the communities. For Newark, this is not just about a celebrity-owned building going up in downtown. For the city, it says this is about creating careers and opportunities for folks who are from Newark. With this building, O'Neill and the city launched Project Newark, modeled after Project Impact. That program is to give a helping hand to women, minorities, and veterans looking to get a career in the construction trade. Not just opportunities for workers, but for the developers of the project as well. So uh, I found a partner in the Bora Group, the Kobe Bryant of developing. We are so proud that even though this is the first high rise in Newark in 50 years, what it really represents is 50 years of progress. Because 50 years ago, someone that looks like me and my family, some the, the people that work on our project, lenders like Margaret and Sherry, it was a different group of people doing these projects 50 years ago, and that's progress. Shack Towers offers spectacular views of the area, across the Hudson to Manhattan and up the Passaic. O'Neill announced another $150 million, 35-story building of 350 market-rate apartments on McCarter Highway and a business mogul who plans to occupy the top floor. On Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday, you find me up here. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'll be up here <laughs> in this area right here. In Newark. Michael Hill, NJTV News. People who are frail or homebound in a swath of Monmouth and Ocean counties are getting just the help they need, and their helpers are getting something, too. Lauren Monka reports. Every week, Tom's River resident Howard Hamilton welcomes a special visitor, Lily, his four-legged companion. He pets her and she cuddles up next to him. Well, the best part is uh, getting all the attention. Lily and her owner, Catherine Perino, are with caregiver volunteers of Central Jersey, an interfaith nonprofit dedicated to providing assistance to the elderly, veterans, and caregivers. Most people want to be in their homes. There's no place like home, and they're surrounded by the things that they love. That's their comfort level. And a lot of people just need a little help to stay in their homes. Catherine's one of 1,200 volunteers who serves those in Northern Ocean and Southern Monmouth counties. Lily, a certified therapy dog, is part of the organization's Caregiver Canines Pet Therapy Program. Lily and Catherine travel to people's homes. They seem to really enjoy the company. The physical contact with an animal that is responding to them, it's almost like, like a little kid hugging a teddy bear. Since many of the elderly in the program don't drive, volunteers take them to the doctor or food shop for them. I guess it's kind of selfish. It makes me feel good. On this day, Marion Florentine carries in Rose's groceries. She shops for her every other week. The two have become close friends. It's a wonderful thing. I don't know what I would do without this service. The nonprofit also has a program for caregivers of individuals with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Volunteers receive additional training and are matched with families to provide relief in their homes every week, giving caregivers a break. They could do whatever they need. So they take a nap, they go shopping, they visit their own friends. The nonprofit also serves those with Alzheimer's and dementia with their Connection Through Music program. Strumming on the old banjo. Oh, thank you. A youth and adult mentor visit with an elderly person in their home. They bond over music. 13-year-old Brody and 85-year-old Bonnie sing all her favorite songs. The music is just the bridge to the connection. So they become really become buddies. 
and friends, and it's an amazing phenomenon. Bonnie's in a rehab facility. Brody now visits her here. It's awesome. I mean, seeing her smile all the time, it's amazing. The 85-year-old says the music reminds her of her childhood. Oh, it just makes you feel like I'm back in West Virginia. Caregiver Volunteers of Central Jersey conducts background checks on their volunteers. The nonprofit, which serves about 2,000 people, relies on private donations and some public funding. These volunteers insist they benefit from the experience as much as the people they're helping. They start out as strangers and they become family. In Tom's River, I'm Lauren Wonko and JTV News. And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. State funding assistance accounts for almost 25 percent of all revenue received by local governments in New Jersey. The National Women's Law Center reports women in New Jersey earn 81 cents for every dollar earned by a man. An average of 7,526 passengers travel through Elizabeth Station on weekdays, and Newark's native Shaquille O'Neal was inducted into the NBA Hall of Fame in 2016. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, preserving Cowtown for posterity. It's not our first rodeo, but it's weekly. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. See you tomorrow. J. Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Have some water. Right? Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.